Hello and welcome to chapter three of Gapinski's Healthcare Finance, sixth edition. Uh, though this lecture will probably be fine for uh, editions four, five, four and five as well. Uh, not much has changed in the world of uh, financial accounting uh, at the level we're going to be working. Uh, but this chapter is, in fact, uh, an introduction to financial accounting, which, as the slide says, is the language that we use uh, in business to communicate uh, the status, the financial status of an organization to the outside world. Um, so in this chapter, we're going to touch on uh, just some of the basics in particular of two of the statements, the income statement and the state, statement of changes in equity. And that's what they're called for a for-profit. And we'll talk about what they're called for a not-for-profit in a second. Um, and I'm going to kind of toggle back and forth between uh, talking about for-profit and not-for-profit. There is a 95% overlap between for-profit and not-for-profit. Some of the terminology is a little bit different. So for folks who uh, work in a, in a not-for-profit environment, I will keep kind of, like I said, toggle back and forth uh, between the terminology. I'll tend to default towards the for-profit terminology. Um, uh, but uh, but it basically, it, it, like I said, it's very, very close uh, with some minor differences. So we're going to talk about financial accounting. Um, oh, I should blow that up. There we go. There we go. Much nicer. Um, and so I said we're going to be studying financial accounting. Um, so what is financial accounting? Well, it's, it, is, it is really the language of business. Um, and it is the language that businesses use to communicate to each other. Um, and they, in particular, the language that we use to communicate uh, externally from our organization. So as the slide here says, it involves identifying, recording, and communicating the operational results and status of an organization uh, as opposed to a subunit. So what does that mean? Well, um, so imagine you have a standalone, independent uh, community hospital um, that is not part of a larger system. Uh, so we've got a few here. Uh, so I'm talking to you from the seacoast of New Hampshire. So for example, Exeter Hospital is right now a standalone uh, community hospital. When we're, so if we're talking about Exeter Hospital, uh, um, the organization is the hospital itself. Um, and then, well, Exeter is actually part of a small system. Uh, there's a parent organization, uh, but Exeter Hospital produces its own. So I guess that's not a perfect example. Um, Exeter, the hospital produces a set of financial statements. And then um, the parent entity, Exeter Health Resources, also produces uh, a, a set of um, uh, financial statements. But because Exeter Hospital is, its, is, an independent, is, is, a, is a corporation, um, that is a subsidiary, um, it, is, it operates, as the slide says, as a organization. So Exeter Hospital has its own set of um, uh, financials. And so that's different um, than, say, so when we're saying an, an organization as opposed to a subunit. So the emergency department at Exeter Hospital is not going to produce its own set of financial statements, right, because it's a subunit. And external um, external audiences tend not to be particularly interested in the finances of an individual subunit. They're interested in how all of the subunits come together uh, to form the overall organization. So, um, and, uh, and we'll talk a little more about what that, you know, why, why, uh, who we're trying to communicate with and why in here in a sec. So financial accounting uh, it, it, information is ultimately used to produce a set of financial statements. The most important are uh, the income statement. That's what we refer to it in the private sector or the, um, uh, uh, or the for-profit sector, excuse me, not private sector, but for-profit sector. Um, and then if you're a not-for-profit, you might call it, you, you, you'll hear uh, um, accounting people kind of bounce back and forth between income statement. The most common terminology in a not-for-profit 
um, set of financial statements would be a statement of operations, or the SOO. Um, so the income statement, and, and this is what we're going to spend the bulk of the this particular um, chapter on is the income statement or statement of operations captures kind of the um, the flow of economic resources into and out of the organization um, by way of capturing the sales of the organization, the revenues of the organization, the expenses of the organization, and then ultimately the profits uh, from the organization. Statement of changes in equity or statement of changes in net assets uh, is captures um, uh, the, a change in the way changes in the way the organization is financed. Um, and we'll get to that in a bit. In chapter four, we'll talk more about the balance sheet uh, or statement of financial position if you're not for profit. And the balance sheet um, shows what resources the organization has um, and how those resources are financed. Um, and then the statement of cash flows is a little complicated to explain, but we'll get into it in more detail. Uh, in chapter four, but it basically reconciles um, uh, the income statement. Uh, if it's done in accrual accounting, uh, it gives us a better picture of what the cash uh, status of the organization is and how the cash levels have changed over the course of the accounting period. And like I said, we'll do more of that later. But those are the four most common um, uh, uh, financial statements that uh, comprise uh, what an organization would report. So um, why do we, so why do we produce these, um, these financial statements? Well, we're, we're trying to communicate um, the financial health of the organization to outsiders um, and provide them a honest and, and um, consistent picture of how the organization is doing economically. Um, so outsiders might be, uh, it will be in particular bankers um, who are lending to the organization. They will be investors. If you're a for-profit organization, they might be investors who are interested in purchasing stock in your organization. Um, they for for-profit or not-for-profit, they may be investors interested in lending money to you as an organization. And that might be in the form of a bank loan, or it might be in the form of a bond, which we'll talk about in a later chapter, uh, what, that, what a bond really is. Um, uh, but basically, you're going to communicate, you're going to use these statements to communicate to outsiders who have an interest in your organization. And that can also include, if you're, especially if you're not-for-profit, it can include um, the community that you service. So like Exeter Hospital services uh, the community of Exeter and, and um, the seacoast area of New Hampshire around, around Exeter. Um, so we're, the, the function of using financial um, accounting uh, to communicate to outsiders is we're going to use uh, uh, industry approved um, uh, methods for uh, that are consistent across organizations so that an outsider, say a banker, will pick up your financial statements and be able to read them very quickly uh, because it's the same format the financial statements are in the same format as any other organization like yours would be. So, so they, so we have these financial standards um, uh, for how we write our financial or how we do our financial accounting so that outsiders uh, don't have to, uh, or so that it, it makes the process of evaluating um, the financial condition of your organization uh, easier to evaluate by an outsider. Now, I keep talking about outsiders, but this information is also of interest uh, to managers inside the organization to see how the overall organization is going. And typically, this the at the the financial statement level is typically, you know, when we talk about managers, we're talking about the C-suite and senior managers um, who kind of have responsibility for the health of the overall organization. It's not going to be your frontline supervisor that's going to be looking at this information because they're going to be more concerned about their individual unit rather than uh, the overall organization. But, um, uh, but if we do our financial accounting correctly, uh, we will be able to present a 
a picture of the organization to the outside world that's accurate and consistent with how other organizations in our industry are doing um, uh, their uh, financial accounting. So, um, so who are the outsiders? I've kind of already talked to that, but again, the outsiders are going to be pe- stakeholders in your organ uh, that have an interest in your organization. So stakeholders could include stockholders as a subset of stakeholders, stakeholders being who out in your organization has an interest outside of your organization has an interest in the financial health of your organization. Well, that would be stockholders, right? If you're a for-profit entity, um, uh, you, you will have stockholders, people who have an ownership stake in your organization. So they want to know how the overall organization is doing. Um, it will be uh, debt investors. So again, bankers who are lending you money or bondholders who um, have loaned you money through using a, a, a debt instrument like a bond. Um, it could also be uh, organizations that are um, your suppliers. Um, they may want to know, you know, if they have, a, if they're, if they are giving you a large amount of, of uh, say supplies on credit, they want to know that your organization is healthy and that they're not going to be left hanging um, because you're not going to be able to pay for your um, uh, pay for the 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 supplies that that they have sent to you uh, on credit. Um, and then it could also be community. If you're a not for profit, it could be community members who are interested in you know the health of your organization um government leaders particularly say if you're a hospital uh who are interested in the health of your organization so then the question is do not-for-profit organizations have to prepare financial statements yes yes they do um uh, uh in particular every organization that seeks outside um capital meaning money from outsiders has to pre- prepare financial statements in accordance with GAAP. And we'll talk about what GAAP is, G-A-A-P, in a minute. Um, but uh, both for-profit and not-for-profit organizations have to prepare financial statements. Only the tiniest uh, organizations um, don't have to prepare uh, financial statements. Um, you know, my wife is a CPA, uh, and she works with a lot of, of um, uh, mom-and-pop organizations um, helping them prepare their financial statements. So basically anybody who takes out a loan from a bank is going to have to prepare a financial statement. Um, but then that applies to certainly any organization large, you know, large enough to be say, a, you know, large multi-specialty clinic or a hospital or a healthcare system. Certainly, uh, even if they're not for profit is going to have to prepare financial statements. Um, and those financial statements would be of interest to the board uh, of directors or, um, board of trustees if you're not for profit um and as well as if you're not for profit the community and so forth so should the preparation and presentation of financial accounting data be regulated well that's a little bit of a philosophical question but the kind of the taking out the should the answer is it definitely is regulated and we'll talk about here in a second about about that um but the the purpose of having regulation is to um, help with the process of standardization. Now, you'll see that not all of the regulation comes from the government. Let's go ahead and switch here. Um, Not all regulation for financial accounting comes from the government. In fact, a lot of the regulation uh, comes kind of from the bottom up, from the industry and from other not-for-profits. So kind of at the top of the pyramid of of the regulatory pyramid is the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is a governmental entity, um, and it has the legal authority to regulate the form and content of financial statements. So if you are a, you know, if you're, if you trade stocks, um, you know, you are uh, in, in the U.S., the Securities and Exchange Commission regulates any, um, any uh, publicly traded company. Um, so you can, you can look up, courtesy of the, of the Securities, Exchange, Securities and Exchange Commission, you can look up the financial statements from any publicly traded company 
uh, in the United States and you can get their financial statements and, and read through them. And after you've done chapters three and four, uh, you should be able to pick up the financial statements for any, co any publicly traded company um, in the United States because the financial statements that we're going to, the, the, the basics that we're going to cover, um, uh, every organization looks about, you know, 95% similar across all, um, all industries. So you could pick up uh, the, 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 the annual report, the 10K for the Ford Motor Company, and you could pick up the uh, 10K or annual report for Hospital Corporation of America or HCA. Um, and, and with the skills that you're going to get from chapters three and four, you should be able to read and understand what the financial condition of um, both of those companies are. Now, there are going to be some differences uh, at the industry level. So like I said, it's not going to be 100% the same, but it's very, very close. Uh, and, you know, we're going to have this, you know, HCA is going to have an income statement, Ford Motor Company is going to have an income statement. HCA is going to have a balance sheet, Ford Motor Company is going to have a balance sheet. They're going to be structured, uh, like I said, 95% the same. Uh, Ford Motor Company is a primarily a manufacturer and HCA is primarily a service provider. So there's going to be some subtleties, uh, subtle differences. But like I said, 95% of the statements are going to look the same. And you should be able to pick up after you've, after you've studied uh, these financial statements, you should be able to pick up any uh, financial statements and, and be able to get a sense of where the organization is. All right. So the SEC kind of has the global uh, authority and responsibility for uh, uh, defining how financial statements are created, but um, they don't do it on their own. It, there is a not-for-profit entity called the Financial Accounting Standards Board, or FASB, um, and they set policy, broad policy, about uh, uh, how financial statements should be uh, created. Um, kind of supporting the FASB are the industry committees of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. So if you have, if you take your taxes to a CPA, um, that person has passed an exam, the CPA exam uh, put out uh, by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. CPAs are, are licensed at the state level, but they all take the same exam. Uh, and then the states kind of uh, have other requirements uh, depending on, you know, at a state by state level, much like uh, in healthcare, you have different, you know, um, uh, you have national boards, but then you have uh, for physicians and nurses, but then you have uh, state level requirements for, um, uh, for getting license licensure. Um, but the uh, AICPA has uh, industry committees. And so this is where I started to talk about like the difference between Ford and HCA, right? So industry committees um, look at some of the fine tuning and some of the ways that we want to present information um, based on the industry itself. So Ford Motor Company as a manufacturer deals with a lot of, of physical inputs, um, so, so a big part of, you know, looking at any, um, manufacturer is the cost of goods sold. Uh, whereas a service industry like a hospital certainly has, a, a you know, um, a, a significant supply expense, but, but we're not, you know, in the healthcare industry, uh, uh, and, and this is speaking to the clinical, uh, service side, as opposed to say, um, Medtronic, who makes, uh, who is a manufacturer. Um, uh, we don't use a lot. Uh, we don't use, uh, our primary product is not a physical thing. It is a service rendered to a patient. So the financial statements are going to look a little bit different, particularly the income statement is going to look a little bit different um, uh, than uh, than uh, for a manufacturer than for a service provider like a like a a hospital. Um, for a an, another example would be say uh, a a natural resources company like a uh, uh, a mining company or a, um, a gas company or oil company is going to look a little. Its balance sheets are going to look a little bit different than a. Uh, hospitals balance sheets, they're still going to be structured roughly the same, but they'll have some information on there about um, uh, 
uh, how much uh, known reserves does the organization have access to? And that's an important part of determining how valuable the company is. And hospitals, of course, don't have known reserves because we're not pulling anything up out of the ground. So those are some of the subtleties um, that get addressed by the AICPA. You know, how do you account for uh, known reserves and, ha and having exhausted them? As opposed to, you know, that's not a thing that we're concerned about uh, in the healthcare industry. So different industries have some specialization uh, on their financial statements about how they're supposed to present a consistent picture. And so, um, so AICPA helps contribute to that. And then kind of continuing down is the um, Healthcare Financial Management Association or HFMA. This is a professional organization for finance people who are uh, interested in healthcare. So I'm a member of the HFMA. Um, and so this is a professional organization that, um, you know, their body uh, members get together and make recommendations for how healthcare should be accounted for. And there's a lot of overlap between, uh, you know, all of these. Okay, so I mentioned GAAP a minute ago. G A A P, GAAP. It's not GAAP, it's GAAP. Um, and GAAP refers to the generally accepted accounting principles. So this is kind of the overall collection of, um, uh, of agreements on how things are supposed to be uh, produced, how financial accounting statements are supposed to be produced, and the conventions that we're going to use um, uh, to, to uh, assemble those financial statements so that we are all communicating the same way, right? We're all... Um, uh, using the same grammar, if you will, uh, to write uh, to write our financial statements. So GAAP only applies to financial accounting statements as opposed to statements constructed for internal use. So if you are a P&L holder, right, if you are in an organization and you are responsible for a division or a department uh, or a clinic that is part of a larger organization. So if you are the um, administrative director or me medical director for the emergency department at um, uh, uh, Exeter Hospital, you probably have a profit and loss statement or a P&L um, that uh, looks like an income statement, um, but it's produced internally for internal use. And since you're nobody, I mean, you might show the P&L to an external lender, but they're really not going to be that interested in, in the P&L um, for your organization, for your little, you know, for your, for your emergency department. They're going to want to see the financial, the audited financial statements for the uh, overall organization. Um, they might find, you know, uh, P&L interesting, but again, the P&L, because it's an internal tool for communicating inside the organization, um, the organization can decide how they want it structured and how they want the, uh, how they want the information organized. So GAAP only applies to financial accounting statements that are going to be used outside um, the organization and uh, uh, to communicate with uh, uh, investors and other stakeholders. And so does GAAP remain static over time? The answer is no, right? The industry evolves. Uh, uh, ways of doing business evolve and the accounting uh, principles and uh, evolve along with the changes in the way we do business. Now, they don't change fast um, uh, because accounting is a pretty conservative um, uh, field, but they do evolve over time. So there's a conceptual framework to GAP, um, and I'm going to run through um, some basic concepts. So we've got some assumptions, some principles, and some constraints. So let's talk about the assumptions. So a couple of assumptions. So we're going to assume um, that there's a specific entity for which the statements apply uh, uh, and, and can be defined. So, so I can define, you know, Exeter Hospital, or I can define um, uh, 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 Rockingham Visiting Nurses Association, uh, or I can define Exeter Health Resources, right, as a specific entity. Um,
or I can define core physicians, right? And so that would be the accounting entity. And these are separate entities um, that can independently seek uh, uh, financing. So second assumption is a going concern. So this is, a, is an entity that has a, um, uh, a life that it is uh, able to continue um, to do business. Uh, and there's no assumption that the entity is going to shut down immediately. Um, so uh, one of the unique things about corporations, right? If you are familiar with, um, what's that uh, uh, ruling? Uh, Citizens United, right? Citizens United uh, said that, um, uh, uh, corporations have certain rights. Confirm that corporations have certain rights, and kind of the, kind of the uh, not to get political, but right. So, so it's been interpreted that you know corporations are people. Um, corporations aren't people, but they are treated as entities um, that have rights um, that have kind of an ongoing life, and so. Um, so we're going to assume that we have this entity that we can kind of draw clear lines around, uh, clear boundaries around and say, this is part of the organization, this is not part of the organization, um, and that that organization is going to have kind of an ongoing life um, uh, uh, of its own, so functioning as a going concern. Next, we assume that we have some time period uh, that's applicable to the statement. So periodicity, right, means we, we're picking some period over which the uh, uh, statements are defined. So an income statement, right, or a statement of operations is typically defined um, over a period of time. So the most common, you know, so we, you want to have an annual report. Uh, at a minimum, organizations will produce an annual report that is audited, an audited annual report. Um, uh, and so the income statement or statement of operations applies to a, year, a period of a year. Uh, most organizations produce quarterly or even monthly um, uh, financial statements, uh, though those uh, financial statements are not typically at those smaller time frames, those uh, financial statements are not audited. What is the difference between an audited and, and, an, and an unaudited financial statement? You, um, so a, um, when a entity prepares their financial statements and uh, to go to a, uh, uh, at a minimum, they will produce a annual audited financial statement, which means that an outside auditor, so a team of accountant, an accountant or team of accountants will come into the organization and will work with uh, the financial staff of the organization to verify that the staff of the organization has followed GAAP, has followed all of the conventions and requirements um, that are generally accepted, um, and the auditor will give the um, the the entity uh, a uh, statement that says whether the entity has been compliant with GAAP or not. This statement is called an auditor's opinion, and what you're kind of after is a clean bill of health, uh, which is called an unqualified opinion. Um, and so this basically means that uh, the auditor has reviewed. Uh, the financial statements and has not found any significant deviations um, from the um, from generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, you could also get a qualified opinion, which means that the auditor uh, has some reservations and they haven't been able to work it out with the financial uh, the the staff of the of the organization. Um, uh, to the satisfaction of the auditors. Now, this doesn't mean that the organization is, the auditor's opinion doesn't mean that the organization is healthy or doing well. It just means that the statements are accurate. So you could have an organization that is struggling financially and get a a unqualified opinion, meaning, uh, you know, that the financial statements are perfect. They are 
perfectly accurate about the fact that the organization is failing, right? So, so a, you can still get an unqualified opinion. You could get a qualified opinion, which means that the auditor doesn't agree with some of the methods that were used to produce the um, financial statements. That doesn't mean that the organization is necessarily doing good, uh, doing well, or doing poorly. It just means that um, the, the auditor does not believe that the financial statements are entirely accurate. And then you can get an adverse opinion from the auditor, which means that the financial statements do not present um, a uh, accurate picture of the financial health of the organization. So all that said, uh, because that's an expensive process, right? It, it's expensive to bring in a team of auditors. Typically, you'll see that done you know, on an annual basis. Most, or, most large organizations produce an annual, um, uh, an annual report that is audited by external auditors, so once a year. Um, but, but again, most organizations, most larger organizations will also produce uh, financial statements on a quarterly or monthly basis. I, I'm not aware of anybody that produces an, a set of financial statements more often than, than um, uh, monthly. That would be a kind of a, a, well, we'll come to that in a minute, uh, but that's a waste of resources to try to do something like that. Um, uh, that said, you'll see um, the finance, finance uh, folks doing kind of continuous estimates of the financial health of the organization, but they won't be producing financial statements uh, more often than monthly. Um, Monetary unit. So we're going to have some assumption that we're going to do the accounting in some sort of monetary unit. So in the United States, we're going to do, you know, uh, we're going to produce our uh, financial statements in, in US dollars. If you're, you know, in France, you're going to do your financial statements in euros. You know, if you're in Japan, you're going to do your statements in yen, right? Um, one of the important points, and we'll talk more about this in just a second, is the fact that um, uh, statements are done in, uh, uh, in current uh, nominal dollars. So they're not adjusted for inflation or deflation. So a 2000, you know, uh, the dollars used on a 2019 financial statement um, are really not the same dollars as uh, used on a 2009 or a 1999 uh, uh, financial statement because we have inflation and a dollar today does not buy what a dollar did a, you know a year or ten years ago, but nonetheless we're going to use dollars if you're in the United States uh, and not um, not yen or uh, Bitcoin or something else. So we've talked about assumptions. Now let's talk about principles. Um, so the principles here are, uh, like I was mentioning a moment ago, uh, historical costs. So we're going to use um, uh, the, the historical uh, cost of something, typically for the, for the bulk of the things that we uh, purchase, we're going to carry them at historical cost. So what does that mean? Let's say we bought a tract of land uh, and ignore buildings for a moment, just talk about land. You know, so un unimproved land, uh, say just outside of Boston um, in uh, 1920, and we held it for 100 years. Now, uh, if you're familiar at all with Boston, you probably 100 years ago, uh, there probably would have been lots of farmland around Boston and uh, you know, outside the city um, and lots of undeveloped land. Uh, today, you know, Boston is a big sprawling uh, uh, city that just kind of has no end until it gets out towards somewhere around Worcester. Uh, folks from Massachusetts will appreciate that. Uh, but otherwise, just think big sprawling area. You know, Boston itself is the core city, but then there's a whole bunch of um, uh, cities around Boston um, that, you know, it's hard to tell when you've left Boston and when you've, you know, moved into the next city over. Uh, so let's say we bought that land 100 years ago for, you know, a thousand dollars and it's in i don't know let's think one of the fancier areas say newton um uh now that land is worth you know uh five million dollars um if we were carrying that land on our if if our if our entity uh had been ongoing since 
uh, uh, you know, 1920, um, and we never did anything with that land other than own it, um, we would still be carrying it at $1,000, even though its market value is $5 million, right? Taking a less extreme example, um, you know, things, things might change over uh, time um, a, little, uh, a little less um, dramatically. Um, but if we bought a piece of equipment five years ago, we carry it on our books at its purchase price, even though its sale price might be something different. Now we do get in with equipment, we get into depreciation and we'll talk about that in a minute. But that said, anything we buy um, for the organization uh, goes onto the financial statements at its purchase price. And it doesn't matter whether it's increased or decreased in value. The key difference here is um, uh, uh, financial assets. So if we're buying stocks and bonds, those get adjusted to fair market value if they are part of an investment. Um, but not to muddy the waters. Think If you're thinking real property, meaning stuff you can touch, um, that's uh, going to be carried at historical costs. Uh, the principle of revenue recognition, and this becomes important with, with the different kinds of accounting, but accrual accounting, um, uh, which we'll talk a little more about in a minute, um, requires revenue recognition in the time in which they are realizable and earned. Okay, so what does that mean? So using a healthcare example, um, what, let's think, um, let's assume your organization has, uh, right, does its financial statements on a calendar year. So the end of the, end of the uh, period for your income statement, for your hosp uh, well, for your clinic, let's say, for your clinic, is December 31st. Um, and a patient comes in on December 31st and gets seen um, in your family medicine clinic. And the bill is going to be $100, but the patient has insurance. And let's just assume that the, the insurance company is going to pay. Uh, that's the allowable charge. And so, uh, the, but the patient uh, has a copay and that's a $20 copay. So on December 31st, the patient hands you a $20 bill and uh, you send a bill to the patient's insurance company. And that bill gets paid, say, 45 days later, you get a check in the mail for $80. Um, under accrual accounting, um, you're going to recognize on December 31st, $100 in revenue because you uh, earned it that day, right? You earned it uh, on December 31st. So it's going to happen in 2019, let's say, um, since let's say that visit happened on December 31st of 2019, um, you're going to report $100 in revenue um, uh, earned uh, uh, in 2019, even though you only actually got $20 of that $100 on December 31st of 2019. And the other $80 didn't come in until February 15th. So we're not going to pay attention to the cash and, and, the, and the cash flow. Uh, uh, we are going to pay attention to when the revenues were actually earned, when the economic value was created. Okay, so we'll talk more about that when we talk about uh, uh, accrual accounting. Now, expense matching is kind of the same thing. Let's say uh, we bought supplies. Uh, we bought a big box of supplies on December 31st. And we don't use those supplies. So December 31st of, of 2019. And we don't use those supplies until January uh, 15th of 2020. Well, the purchase of the supplies was done on in in 2019 but we're going to actually recognize the expense in 2020 because that's when we use the supplies to generate revenue so we're going to match our expenses to our revenue so even though we might have bought a big box of supplies at, at a significant expense in 2019 we're not actually going to recognize that expense until we use the supplies, at which point we will recognize the expense. Um, full disclosure, 
So this kind of goes to the, you know, the auditor's opinion and the, uh, you know, qualified or unqualified um, uh, 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 auditor's opinions, right? And, and not just for the auditor, but the principle here is the financial statement should contain a complete picture of the economic and financial events of the organization. So this, the financial statement should have, um, when you look at that financial statement, you should have a complete and, and clear picture of the economic health of the organization. Now, um, let me continue to the next page to talk about constraints because it's relevant to full disclosure. Now, there are constraints on full disclosure. Um, if you were to report every single transaction that happened at a hospital uh, on your financial statements, you'd have a thing that was like a million pages long, right? So uh, what we have to do at some point is make a judgment call about the materia materiality, easy for me to say, materiality, I uh, usually get hung up on periodicity, uh, but the materiality of, of transactions. So we're going to make some decision at some point to roll up uh, and summarize um, the uh, transactions at a certain you know, level of aggregation. But we're also uh, going to uh, take into consideration uh, things that might not have happened yet, but, uh, but might. So for example, if we um, uh, have a lawsuit pending and it represents a significant, potential significant loss to the organization, that would be material right? It would be important information for an outside investor to know about. Because if you as um, a, uh, a manager or you as a current owner know that there's a big risk coming down the line toward your organization and you don't, don't um, uh, tell uh, a potential investor or lender about it, your, 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 your financial, on your financial statements, then your financial statements don't accurately represent um, the financial status of the organization. So we have to kind of uh, engage in a cost benefit decision um, uh, in, to, in order to try to have um, the a clear picture, an accurate picture of the health of the organization. Um, but at the same time, we have to rec recognize that, you know, we have to aggregate at some level and, um, and we have to um, leave some information out. Um, and so because of the fact that, you know, we could have, we could, you know, have the, financial staff doing all kinds of reports and detailed appendices and so forth. But at some point we have to say, look, that's just not worth it. It's not adding more clarity to an outsider's ability to evaluate our organization. So there's kind of a, a point of diminishing returns. So that's cost, be cost benefit materiality. Um, Okay, so I've mentioned uh, accrual accounting a minute ago, talking about revenue recognition and, and expense recognition. Um, the other kind of accounting is cash accounting. So if you ever had um, a you know lemonade stand as a kid, um, or you know you mowed lawns or shoveled snow, uh, uh, you know as a part-time job. Um, you know, on your own, you have your, you have your own little business. Um, and chances are you, to whatever degree you decided to do uh, some sort of accounting, you are probably doing it in cash. Um, uh, and so cash accounting basically recognizes a tra an, an event whenever a cash transaction takes place. So if you got paid, that was a, uh, you know, then you recognize the revenue. If, if Mrs. Jones, who you mowed the lawn for, um, I uh, said, I'll pay you next week, then you didn't recognize the revenue. Um, so, uh, uh, so cash accounting really only done, uh, really only used by the simplest businesses and in particular businesses that are not seeking outside funding. Because even if you're a simple business, um, you still have to produce uh, uh, financial statements in accordance with GAAP uh, to be able to show to your bank uh, uh, or other finance uh, or other financial institution that's lending you money. 
Um, so basically, we're not interested in cash accounting in, in, in this course at all. I, um, I mention it because it's there. Um, it does exist, but we are only going to be concerned with accrual accounting. Um, so accrual accounting uh, recognizes an event when a cash obligation is created. So this is, as the statement says, more complicated, kind of what I was just describing a second ago, where we had, you know, you've got a family medicine clinic and somebody comes in on December 31st uh, and they get seen and, and there's a $100 um, uh, allowable charge and you get $20 today and 45 day, days later, you get the other $80 and you've got to reconcile that to say, oh, that $80 that just came in, that actually is $80 that um, uh, that completes the the um, uh, the 2019 um, transactions. It's not actually part of the 2020 transactions, right? So so it's a, a a little bit more complicated. But once you work through it, it actually gives you a better picture of how the organization is doing from an economic perspective in terms of you know it, it as a business uh, earning earning revenues and providing services. So accrual accounting is required by GAAP. So, um, so unless you're running the equivalent of a lemonade stand, um, you're going to be required to uh, uh, use accrual accounting. And then modified cash accounting is some blend of the two. Again, not going to get into that, but those things are out there. Just remember, we're really only concerned with accrual accounting. All right. So now some information. Uh, about how we go about capturing um, uh, the accounting data, right? So we're, the baseline is a transaction, right? And so a transaction is an exchange of goods, including cash uh, or services from one individual or business to another. So a transaction would be, um, you know, something as simple as I go into the uh, convenience store and hand, uh, you know, and hand the clerk a dollar and, uh, he gives me a candy bar, right? That's a transaction. Um, uh, and it can be individual to business or business to business um, or individual to individual, right? Um, but if we're doing a financial statement, so once a transaction is identified, once it actually happens, it has to be recorded, right? Or posted um, to an account. So we're going to get into a number of different examples of accounts, but... Um, uh, so going with that really simple uh, example of uh, uh, the purchase of a candy bar, um, the, the, the uh, store would um, recognize, you know, sales revenue uh, in the revenue account, they would recognize a dollar and then they would decrease their um, uh, or credit their um, uh, uh, their supply account uh, or inventory account by a dollar, right? Uh, or by whatever the, the cost of the, um, the candy bar was to them. So it would decrease. Um, uh, so we'd have an increase in the cash account. Actually, there's multiple things here. Increase in the cash account, um, increase in sales, and then there'd be adjustments to the inventory uh, accounts as well. So, um, we have, uh, so we have, something has to be posted to an account. And notice I said uh, uh, it's got two accounts. So you have a sales account and a cash account. Um, so we'll talk about, about double entry here in a second. Um, businesses use a chart of accounts. So you're gonna have all these different accounts uh, and they're gonna be captured uh, in the chart of accounts. So we have a sales account and a cash account and an inventory account and so forth. And all those things are listed in the chart of accounts uh, in your accounting department. <clears throat> so, like I said, each transaction is posted um, uh, in, by, in, in, into a, as a journal entry, um, and journal entries are always posted twice, uh, which is called a system, uh, it was called the double entry system. Um, and to handle those double entries, accounts are set up in T format and hence are, are known as T accounts. Um, so uh, uh, with a T account, um, for example, um, a hospital maybe buys uh, $5,000 in supplies on credit. Um, 
you'd have a inventory account that would have a uh, would have a debit uh, or it would an entry on the left side and an accounts payable uh, because they're buying it on credit. So they're, they're, that's called, an, it, that creates what's called an accounts payable. Basically an, uh, an accounts payable is an IOU by the organization. So, and that would create a credit uh, of $5,000. So I was just saying, uh, T accounts, so I'll demonstrate that real quick. So my example was that the organization, say a hospital, buys $5,000 uh, in supplies on credit. So we're going to have two T accounts. They look like T's, right? Hence the name. And, uh, the, and, and debit and credit, you've probably heard the phrase uh, or, or the, the, the term, is not a statement of good or bad. Like it's not good to have a debit and bad to have a credit or good to have a credit and bad to have a debit. It really literally from an accounting perspective, it literally refers, it's like left and right. So debits on the left, credits on the right. Um, and so, and so this account might be um, the uh, inventory account. And this account might be um, the accounts, that down, accounts payable. So I'm going to abbreviate that AP. We'll do more of this later. Um, the accounts payable. So when I get uh, new inventory in, I debit inventory and I credit accounts payable. And um, so that's double entry. Uh, and when I use my inventory up, this is getting into a little more, uh, a little more detail here, but let's say I use a thousand dollars of the $5,000 in inventory. Uh, when I use it up, I credit inventory and then I net out the new balance. So I go from $5,000 in inventory to $4,000 in inventory. But when I use it up, um, inventory is credited and, and um, uh, supply expenses are debited. But we'll get into this. So again, two transactions. Well, so that, then we'd have, um, say supply, ex supply expense would have a thousand now. Whether something increases or decreases uh, as a result of uh, a credit or a debit depends on the type of item. Um, we're not going to get into this in any detail in this book. Um, if you want to dig into this and it's really exciting to you, uh, you should take a true accounting class uh, and, you'll, and you'll learn all about, you know, what gets debited and what gets credited and what does that mean. Uh, this is as, as deep as we're going to go on T accounts and uh, 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 for this, uh, for this purpose. Okay, so coming back to our slides. Um, so uh, we have the double entry system, we use T accounts, so we've talked about all that. So let's uh, keep going. Okay, so continuing with the idea of recording and compiling the data. Ultimately, we, we gather up all that all those transactions, and we use them to create the financial statements. So like I mentioned before, we've got the four primary financial statements. These are the for profit names for them. Um, and just again, get used to kind of toggling back and forth. Um, so the primary uh, means for disseminating uh, the financial statements is the annual report. Uh, it begin, you know, so you can pull down an annual report. Uh, the the ones that um, not-for-profits produce that you can typically pull off the um, internet tend not to actually have uh, the complete financial statements in them. If you, you can get, like I mentioned earlier, you can get the full financial statements for any uh, for-profit publicly traded company. So if you want to, if you want to check one of these out, you can go to, you know, um, I believe it's Edgar. 
Uh, it's called Edgar. Um, it is the database for the SEC, and you can pull down uh, the 10K, which is the is the um, uh, the is the name of an annual report for a publicly traded company. So for HCA or Tenet or Pfizer or any of those organizations, you can pull it down. You can actually read their uh, complete annual report. So uh, it begins with, so a 10K will, will have some information about the organization, uh, talking about kind of the um, uh, operating results and, and kind of what's expected to happen in the future. Then they'll have, uh, uh, the actual financial statements and the, the text we're going to use doesn't get into notes and when are notes required and all that kind of stuff. Again, that's, uh, you know, deep financial, you know, deep accounting kind of work. We're doing very much just an overview, blowing over all this, uh, information. Um, but, um, but if you actually pick up a financial statement, um, uh, uh an audited, you know, finance, set of financial statements, you will see that there are a, a whole lot of notes um, that come along with the, uh, with the financial statements that provide additional clarity about how the amounts were arrived at, whether there were any estimates used, and what was the methodology for the estimates, uh, and so forth. And then there'll be supplementary information um, to explain things like, you know, hey, we have a pending lawsuit. Um, or we have um, intellectual capital that is going to, um, uh, uh, or intellectual property rather, that's going to uh, go off patent or off copyright. And so that's the kind of information that would be in the notes. All right, so that is part one of, uh, of chapter three. I'm going to do uh, two more parts here for, uh, so I'm going to break this up because uh, I don't want you to go crazy. Um, so take a break, take a breather, come back and, and watch uh, part two. Key thing to uh, part one was why we produce financial statements, to communicate in a standardized manner with the outside world. That standardized, that standardized method comes, starts with the SEC and then there are other supporting and industry groups that, that get in to help develop uh, an accurate uh, financial statement. The key to financial statements is their accuracy, not the actual health of the underlying organization, but the accuracy of a good set of financial statements is accurate. It doesn't actually mean that the organization is doing well. All right, let's do part two.